Hi there, this is Solitary Ronin from Solitary Ronin Films and welcome to another box set battle and this one is a Sam Fuller special and it should be an interesting box set battle because I haven't actually decided beforehand myself who the winner is so it's the Fuller at Fox box set Five films from 1951 to 1957 and the indicator Sam Fuller at Columbia 1937 to 1961. Um, Sam Fuller started as a newspaper boy, a newspaper man became a pulp fiction writer, was in World War Two in the infantry, came back as a screenwriter and then started writing and directing his own films. His films are just different from other people's films in the 50s. His films have an authenticity, they have a directness very much like the man. They have a truth to them. There's a grittiness. He really did some dark stuff that he somehow got through because his films are generally kind of low budget. We'll start with the indicator box set because it's an unusual box set in the sense that it is a Samuel Fuller box set. But of the seven films, actually only two of them were directed by Sam Fuller, which is kind of unusual. Um, a few of them were written by Sam Fuller or based on a Sam Fuller book before the last two were actually directed by Sam Fuller. So the seven films so, Indicator, I've put three on one disc, so there's a nice booklet. Um, so, spine number 76 is It Happened in Hollywood, Adventure in Sahara and Power of the Press. These are from 1937, 38 and 43. Um, it Happened in Hollywood, directed by Harry Lachman. Adventure in Sahara by D. Ross Lederman and Power of the Press directed by Lou Landers. It Happened in Hollywood is actually, I mean all these films are like under 70 minutes. That's another thing about Sam Fuller films, you know obviously he didn't direct these ones. But his films are usually very economical, there's not a lot of wasted celluloid he gets to the point, um, like I say, they're very direct and they're just different. Um, it happens in Hollywood, the co stars Faye Ray, and it's about a Western actor, the change between silent and sound. He's a big silent star, but when sound comes in, he can't really deliver lines very well. So he gets kicked out, he becomes poor but he desperately wants to keep up the idea, you know, that he's still in films, especially to his young fans. He gets the offer to be in a gangster film but shoot a cop and he's not comfortable with this because again his fan club wouldn't like it, even though the studio boss is like, you don't have any fans, everybody's forgotten about you. It's actually a sweet little film. It's not great by any imagine uh, by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I won't be in any hurry to watch it again. 
but it is a sweet little film. There's a great scene where he throws a party for all these Hollywood friends and all these celebrities turn up, but in the film it's actually impersonators. And again, it's to show this when he's um, this sick kid who's in his fan club that he knows all these celebrities, even though it's impersonators. And Indicator do a great job, again, because many of these people were uncredited in the film, so Indicator kind of slows down the scene and picks out all these people and who played them, who played Charlie Chaplin and all of that. It's, I mean, again, that's just an example of the little things that Indicator do really well. Um, and then you have Adventure in Sahara, which is a foreign legion swashbuckler or a fez buckler about a guy who joins to avenge his brother's death at the hands of this evil commandant. Again, it's under an hour, but it rattles along. Um, and again, it's a lot of fun. And then we have Power of the Press, which is the best one um, in this first disc. Um, again, it's about the newspaper business, it's about cutting corners and not telling the truth just to sell papers and the scandal that's uncovered um, and it's a lot of fun. Um, the limited editions, the extras, sorry. Um, Again, the party scene, like I've said, there's a seven minute talk about Sam Fuller with Tim Robbins. You know, later in his career, he became an actor for Wim Wenders and um, Godard, because the French New Wave loved his films. He became friends with Tim Robbins and Tarantino and Jim Jarmusch. So that's an interesting disc, a lot of fun. Perhaps not something you're going to revisit that often. Then the second disc um, is 1949-1952, Shockproof, directed by Douglas Sirk, of all people, and Scandal Sheet. And again you have the booklet. Um, like I said, Shockproof um, stars, uh, sorry, was directed by Douglas Sirk um, and Scandal Sheet is directed by Phil Carson. Um, Shockproof stars Cornell Wilde as a hard-bitten parole officer um, who falls for Patricia Knight, who's a murderess who's out of prison. It's a great little film. And then um, Scandal Sheet, again, based on Fuller's novel, The Dark Page, again about the newspaper industry um, and about murder and intrigue, which is quite awesome. Again, this one just has a booklet to go along with the two films. And then we have the two films that were actually directed by Sam Fuller. So we have The Crimson Kimono from 1959, which is one of his best, which might be the best in this box. It's just a stunning film. There's lots of amazing things in it. It's about the death of a stripper and investigated by this good-looking all-American detective and his war buddy, um, a Japanese-American detective. A lot of it's set in Little Tokyo. Um, it's just so many, so much great stuff about race relations. It's because again, Sam Fuller was a very forward-thinking guy as far as race relations. You know, Asian characters in his films weren't stereotypical. Um, he really was ahead of the game when it came to kind of talking about race in films, as he would um, a lot. Again, we get a booklet. I mean, this is one of his best. This is just an absolutely fantastic film. Um, 
So we have a 10 minute extra on the culture of the crimson kimono by Curtis Hansen. We have a 15 minute um, kind of video essay about the triangles within the film. Um, the, both detectives fall for um, the same woman. We have a 25 minute documentary featuring Scorsese and Vim Vendors and Fuller's wife and daughter. We have quite a bizarre 22 minute um, essay from 1989, um, Sam Fuller on Henry Chappie's couch, which is a French TV show where the guest would lie on a psychiatric couch essentially. Um, but the thing with this disc and the next disc is they have three hours of unedited rushes from the film The Typewriter, The Rifle and The Movie Camera, the famous documentary about Sam Fuller. So there is um, there is like three hours worth of footage as he's interviewed by Tim Robbins, which I haven't watched all three hours of it, I'll admit. Um, trailers and of course the booklet. But The Crimson Kimono, I mean I could do a video almost on the Crimson Kimono itself. I know I just did one in the Naked Kiss, which is just amazing. And the Crimson Kimono is just amazing as well. Um, the fact it doesn't go for kind of nice, easy tie-ups and nice, easy endings and everybody lives happily ever after. Fuller didn't really believe in that because that's not life. So the last disc, the last film in the collection is Underworld USA. Um, from 1961 which again is absolutely wonderful it's not quite as good as Crimson Kimono but it's certainly just as, almost as good um, this stars Cliff Robertson as a man seeking revenge for the death of his father this one has um, an interview with Martin Scorsese it has an analysis by Barry Forshaw, who wrote American Noir. There's an audio 62 minute, a Sam Fuller masterclass of inventors. And again, there's another 212 minutes of the rushes with um, Tim Robbins from 1996. And again, this has another booklet. So there's absolutely tons of stuff. Again, Underworld USA has a lot of dark stuff going on. Um, beautifully shot. Um, and well acted with a typical fuller kind of ending. So that is the indicator box set. And then we'll go on to the Fox box set. So now we have the Fuller at Fox box set, where you reach a massive cinema. This is five films from 1951 to 1957. Even though I'm not sure where I'm going to put it in my Eureka Masters of Cinema numbered spine collection because it's spine number 111, 116, 127, 216 and 217. So it's, it's very confusing where I'm going to put it. So this one has a nice booklet with images and essays as you would expect. So the first one, as far as spine number, is Pick Up on South Street. So all these are written and directed by Sam Fuller, unlike the indicator set. Pick Up in South Street is my favourite Sam Fuller film, even though The Naked Kiss has given it a run for its money. A great performance by Richard Widmark, Thelma Ritter, as a an informer who just wants to have enough money for a good burial. It's that kind of Sam Fullerness. Um, it is a kind of anti-communist film, but 
it's done in such a way that Fuller still got into trouble because obviously Richard Widmark that isn't really doing it for his country or you know he isn't actually helping the police out in any way he's just doing it for himself um, these three characters prostitute a pickpocket and a thief and a informer um, you know you're, they're not your typical Hollywood um, heroes and heroines particularly um, full of wonderful dialogue it's just a great film I think this made my favourite 150 um, this has about a 35 minute interview with critic filmmaker Kent Jones and a video interview with Francois Giraff and there's an excerpt from Sam Fuller on French television because obviously he did a lot of French television because like I say the new wave loved him next is 40 Guns with Barbara Stanwyck one of only four westerns that Sam Fuller made but it's absolutely wonderful um, this is probably vying for the with the Crimson Kimono from a fourth favourite Sam Fuller film um, this is 1957 again only 80 minutes but it doesn't need to be any longer because it's just so economic so punchy it's beautifully shot there's an amazing tracking shot as characters walk up the whole street and the town it's just beautifully photographed again Barbara Sandwick an amazing performance um, as a strong woman which you didn't really see that often in westerns outside of Johnny Qatar which strangely enough the French loved as well um, an amazing film with a an, well an almost amazing ending which they kind of had to adjust slightly um, looks absolutely beautiful it's another fuller stunner um, this one has reversible artwork not all of them do some of them just have an image in the inside but 40 guns is another fuller corker again I'm probably gonna have to reassess Fuller's position because a lot of these I'd seen a long time ago a lot of them I hadn't seen but I think he will have to go up in my director rankings I don't think I actually really included them in my director series video just because I hadn't seen enough of his films or recently enough um, next from 1951 is his first film at Fox which is Fixed Bayonets which is kind of riff on his Steel Helmet film. Again, this reminds me a lot of Robert Aldridge's Attack with Jack Palance in the sense of it's cheap, it's fairly studio bound, but that kind of adds to it. You know, they built this set and then Fuller put on an ice machine and made the whole place treacherous. So when actors are falling about and stuff like that it's probably it's fairly real obviously Fuller famously had a Luger I believe that he used to fire in the air on set at one point he fired it in a screening room with Zanuck to see whether the ricochet theory would work or not yeah it's quite a character um, and this one just has the card to say that this box set is number 1813 um, I think is it 3000 or 6000 editions of this set again this is a really good one because he was in the infantry himself he always wanted to make war in his films a bit more realistic obviously he couldn't get too gory these days but there's a wonderful scene featuring somebody's ear um, again so it's a smaller film um, Richard Basehart's really good in it um, there is an actor in a few Fuller films you know, I can't think of his name it's a really nice solid gritty little film 
basically following round just one kind of unit of guys. But it's a really good one as well. Next we have 1954 and Hell in High Water starring Richard Widmark which is a submarine film about a secret mission. Um, again this one he wasn't really that keen on himself he kind of just did it as a favour to Zanuck really. He only co-wrote it. Um, it's 103 minutes and you really kind of feel that length. I think Fuller's films at their best are kind of shorter and more compact and economical. This one at 103 minutes is too long. Um, it's a fun little film but I would say um, it's perhaps, well I think it is the weakest of this set. It's interesting nonetheless. And finally, the last film in this set from 1955 is House of Bamboo. Actually shot in Japan, which um, Fuller was very excited about. Again, it's 102 minutes. Again, it's bordering on the 10 minute too long. But this is another corker um, starring Robert Ryan and Robert Stack, who I kind of feel is perhaps the weak link of it. Um, it's about robberies that are happening by ex-American servicemen in Tokyo and Robert Stack turns up. He may not be who he seems to be and vagles his way into the gang led by Robert Ryan with Cameron Mitchell as his number two. Even though there's undercurrents of why he's the number two and then Robert Stack replaces him as the number two. Um, there's terrific scenes. Again, the Japanese characters are treated with respect and not as stereotypes. Um, there's a wonderful scene in a warehouse robbery whereas typically in American films you would have music but there's no music because um, Robert Ryan has this rule of if somebody gets shot or wounded you leave them behind or you just kill them and leave them behind but he saves Robert Stack who gets injured and of course that starts the, the jealousy of Cameron Mitchell as he's kind of not Robert Ryan's favourite anymore um, it, it's in colour it's gorgeous um, Helen Highwater's in colour as well but it's not quite as gorgeous um, Fuller's kind of known for big sweaty close-ups and things like that. There's not as much in that in House of Bamboo and the colour. I think Fuller is one of those guys, a bit like Sajid Ray, who I'm obviously doing a series on, that his colour films aren't quite as good, I don't think, um, visually as he's black and white. So I think Samuel Fuller is much better as a black and white filmmaker, if that makes any sense. Um, so his colour films aren't quite as good as far as the look of them. But this is another four out of five corker. Again, perhaps um, a little over long, 102 minutes, but still a really good film. And again, if you're a fan of Robert Ryan, it's a must see. It's funny, you kind of see the difference between Robert Stack, who's kind of always a bit stiff for me dependable kind of you know solid actor and then you've got Robert Ryan who is just this kind of coiled spring of like danger and like edginess um, and you really see the difference between the two actors in this film so that's Fuller at Fox against Fuller at Columbia but which one is the best one? Which one wins the battle of the box sets? It's actually quite difficult because even although the indicator set only has two films that Fuller actually directed, the other five are fun films and the extras on the... Um, indicator set are amazing 
However, I should have actually said the extras because you do actually get. I was remiss on the fox set. Um, so you do get commentaries. Um, there's a fuller life directed by his daughter. There's audio archives from the NFT on Fuller on 40 Guns. Um, there's a commentary on fixed bayonets. There are there's a commentary on Hell and High Water and a 45 minute look at Richard Widmark. And there's actually two commentaries on House of Bamboo and a wonderful kind of summation of Fuller at Fox by David Cairns. Which I should have actually mentioned when I was just going through them. Apologies for that. Um, so the extras on Fuller at Fox are pretty good as well. Um, but I would probably, I mean, I would recommend buying both sets. This isn't a, oh yeah, buy one but don't buy the other set. Buy both of these Sam Fuller sets. He is an important, one of the most important American filmmakers, influential on the French and modern indie filmmakers. Um, I've probably underappreciated him in actual fact, so like I said, I'm going to probably have to reassess his position in directors after watching these films. But I think probably by a small margin, the winner's probably Fuller at Fox, just because all the films were actually directed by Sam Fuller. As fun as the little films, or as fun as the films are that aren't directed by him in the indicator set, granted the two that are, Crimson Kimono is a spectacular film, um, under World USA is really really good as well, but I think the fact that the five films on the Fox set were actually all directed by Fuller I would say the Fox set wins um, just by a narrow margin. I mean, Hell in High Water is possibly the only one that I wouldn't be in that much of a rush to watch again. Otherwise, the other four films, especially Pick Up on South Street, cause, which I love, 40 Guns and House of Bamboo are also really amazing films. Um, so really, Hell and High Water is the only one I'm probably not going to revisit for a while. Whereas in the Indicator set, really, I'm probably not going to watch the ones not directed by Fuller anytime soon. But they're still solid, fun little films. So thanks very much for watching this very rambly box set battle. Fuller versus Fuller. But this, uh, to sum it up, Fuller wins. And you'll win if you buy both Fuller box sets. So thanks very much for watching. Hopefully you'll join me again for more box set battles if I ever get around to watching more of my box sets. This is Solitron from Solitron Films. Saying farewell.